Patty. And hello everyone. It's so nice to have everyone here this morning. Is, is people comfortable or is it a little warm in here? Vanita, mm -hmm. would you please turn up <laughs> or turn down the temperature? Don't turn on this person. No, I was gonna say up, but we have to go down when it's air conditioning. Thank you. Um, announcements, I do have a, uh, appetite, well, I wouldn't really call it an advertisement, but it's the invitation from the Thornburg Church for a vacation Bible school. And uh, if any of you have my phone. Church and it's from uh, pre-K to the sixth grade and they just wanted to invite everyone to their Sunday school so I'll put it out on the foyer. Are there any other announcements? Okay, do we have any birthdays? Anniversaries? Concerns. I have a, a granddaughter in Tulsa. She's 21 and she has this flu. Her folks were out there visiting when they got burdened. And, like and she has the coronavirus. Yes. What's her name? Those were the ones that sponsored that. 
Okay, if there's nothing else, Pastor Laura, did you have anything else? Nothing else, we're going to do our centering words. Rejoice and give thanks, for the Lord takes pleasure in the people. And now, if you would open your hymnal to page 61, Come Thou, Almighty uh, King, verses 1 through 1 and 4.
So here, listen to our scripture. In the third year of the reign of King Joachim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Then the king commanded his palace master, Ashpenaz, to bring some of the Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility, young men without physical defect and handsome, versed in every branch of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and insight and competent to serve in the king's palace. They were to be taught the literature and the language of the Chaldeans, and the king assigned them a daily portion of the royal rations of food and wine. They were to be educated for three years, so that at the end of that time they could be stationed in the king's court. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azria from the tribe of Judah. And thus is the reading of our word, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today we're in the second week of our sermon series, Living in Uncertain Times. And we're talking about biblical figures who lived during uncertain times in the Bible. Last week we talked about Job and all of his suffering. And we looked at how Job chose faith even amidst all of the suffering that he was having. And today we're going to look at Daniel. And what we're going to find there is that we're going to learn that we can, can trust and hope in, God, in Christ even through times of persecution. And so the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel that we're looking at here, it's part of the prophetic division of the Bible. It's part of that piece of prophetic literature that we have in our canon. And Daniel was a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew that was in exile during the time of the Babylonian captivity. And he was among uh, uh, other young Hebrew men who were chosen from the tribe of Israel in Babylon to be trained as scholars and servants to the Babylonian Empire. Now Daniel was among the royalty uh, of Israel, and so he was one of the, the royal family who had become a part of those who would go to serve in the Babylonian Empire. Yet God's people, regardless of their circumstances and being in exile, they were called to continue to be a holy, holy nation. Even in exile, God expected his holy people the people of Israel to be a set-apart nation even inside this captive, ca captivity. Now Daniel, he lived through some pretty uncertain times as if you read the book of Daniel. You see that even during the exile under, in Babylon, he, he suffered some, some many uncertain times from death threats to idol worship to temptations and, and tempta uh, temperamental kings to backbiting officials and puzzling dreams that he had to deal with, and a lot of other difficult problems. Now, those were just a few of the many things that Daniel goes through as we read the book of uh, Daniel. And he faces all of this in the 70 plus years that he's stuck there in Babylon, in exile. Not just Babylon, but even Babylon gets taken over eventually by the Medo-Persians. Now, in the Old Testament, God's people were exiled from the Promised Land because of their sin. They had sinned against God, and so God had, in, in their idea, had sent this, this conquering nation to take them in. And so here they were, the empires of the ages conquered the, the people of Israel, and they wouldn't become an independent nation again for thousands of years down the line. Exile was a period of time for them of transition. It was a time where they had to learn uh, a, a few things, and it wasn't a very short time at that either. It was a pretty long period of transitioning and learning. And the Israelites needed to settle into their new home. They needed to make a place in this strange land that they were in. And, and they also would see times of prosperity and times of persecution as they were there in exile. In the first six chapters of Daniel, we follow this group of Israelites, the, the four that I named, particularly Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azria. Uh, of course, we all know their names change as we go on along the line, other than Daniel, but the other three's names uh, we know more so as uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. So, here we have these four young men who came from royal families, and we follow them in, in those first six chapters of Daniel. 
uh, as they stay loyal to God, as they try to continue to remain loyal followers of Yahweh. And despite the challenges that come to them throughout that time of living in a strange nation with people who worship strange gods. Among other things, they were constantly being threatened with uh, threats of imprisonment or death. And so throughout their time there, we see many, many different times where they are threatened with death. Daniel, in, in this time as we read it, uh, he rose in the ranks of the king's court and eventually he had great influence on the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. He became of great use to Nebuchadnezzar because he could interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. Daniel is noted for interpreting those many dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, some of them quite strange. And he was also known for being a man of God, even during the worst times when people tried to persecute him. As we look through the pages of Daniel, we see that Daniel experienced times of ex uh, the, this time of exile in his life. And, and in there, he had some times that were, we would consider to be good times. He was a wise man, and he was uh, very good at leadership. And so he became very uh, favored. He had a good job with the king, and he had a great influence with Nebuchadnezzar throughout the time of Neb Nebuchadnezzar's reign. So for a long period there, he had it pretty good. But there were also times inside of that where things weren't so great and where he was persecuted. But instead of revolting against this exile, he strove throughout everything that happened to serve God and despite any of the circumstances he was going through. Now the faithfulness of Daniel gave him favor with God because he continued to remain faithful to God, continued to pray to God, and to always keep God first in his life, that exile, during that time of exile, Daniel was favored by God. And Daniel, because of his faith, thus was saved from many situations by God. One of which was the story of Daniel in the lion's den which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, and you probably have heard a number of times, even you young kids, I'm sure you've heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den. When you get to chapter 6, where Daniel in the lion's den, that story exists, Daniel's a pretty old man at that time. He, he's been in exile for a long time. He came to, to Babylon as a boy from Jerusalem, and he's been there with the Babylonian king for a long time. And so he is roughly, a little over 70 years has passed in there, and so he's roughly in his late 80s to early 90s. I mean, think about it. Here he is, this old man, and now he is having to become a, an advisor to the Medo-Persian king, King Darius. Another country has come along and conquered Babylon, and so here we go again. It's the same old story, verse 2. Here at Daniel's, at the lovely day, age of eight, late 80s to early 90s, here Daniel is doing it all over again. And so um, Daniel continues to do what he's been doing all of these years and remains faithful to God. And so he continues to pray every day, every morning, every noon, every night. Daniel is praying to God. Every day, like clockwork, Daniel goes and he does his prayers and his worship to God. And, and he doesn't do it, you know, wherever he happens to be. Daniel, no matter where he is, what, no matter what the work he has to do for the, the uh, government is official, he goes back to his home, to his special room where he prays to an open window that faces the temple in Jerusalem and continues to pray to God morning, noon, and night. And so Daniel openly prays to God every day, even after a law gets passed that says he, can, he can't pray to any other god but the king. We were not supposed to pray to anyone but Darius. And, and so even though he's threatened with being thrown into a pit with lions, he continues to believe that his god is greater than any of that. And so when Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den, here again, because he has remained faithful to God, Daniel is saved from the lion's den. And he, God displays his power to all of the kingdom there of the Medo-Persians. 
And King Darius there then quickly repents, seeing the power of Daniel's God, and he turns to God uh, and believes in him. Daniel and his companions are for us uh, great reminders of how we need to be in those times when we are amidst times of distress and pain and suffering, uncertainty, uh, things that, that we don't have any control of. And the book of Daniel is clear, just like the rest of the Bible, that God is sovereign over everything. God is in control, God has the power, and God will do what God needs to do. And so even the sufferings that the people experienced were simply tools in God's hands to work his good in the world. This is how we have to understand suffering in our world as well. When we, can, when we look at God, we need to understand that God is good and he has a sovereign hand. And whatever is happening in the world, God will use that for the good of his plan in the world. We can trust that God will never abandon us. And that as we examine ourselves and we repent of our sin that, and we resolve to walk in obedience to God's command, that, that uh, God will never let us go. That God will be there and help us to be strong even when we suffer. However, we must hold fast and let God work all things that are for his good through and in us. Sometimes it's too easy for us to let go of God when we're in the midst of suffering, when we're in the midst of uncertainty and pain. Daniel and his friends, they were there, and they were in ex exile for a number, a large number of years, most of their lives, all, almost all of their lives. Daniel, they were trained to be a part of the king's, uh, king's court and were there for the king's service, even though they themselves were of royal blood in the top tribe of Israel. They did well to submit to the authority and the rule of this king, even one as ty tyrannical and wicked and idolatrous as Nebuchadnezzar, which is consistent with what Jeremiah 29, 5 through 14 tells us, in which God tells those who are in exile from the tribe of Israel to seek the welfare and good of the city. Now we as followers of Christ can learn much from Daniel and his friends. Being holy during suffering and pain often means that we need to see the good, uh, see, seek the good of others around us. That we need to seek to do good for the others around us. When we're suffering, it's so easy for us to turn away from God and to focus on our own pain and our own hurt and all of the things that are going on with us and to neglect to see that there are others out there in the world who are also suffering, and some who may be suffering even more than us. Daniel, though he was in a foreign and strange land, he never lost sight of the one true God. He never stopped worshiping that God and listening to God in his commands for him. Daniel was a man of two kingdoms. He distinguished himself as a high official in this, earth, in this earthly kingdom to which he was brought, and then he also looked forward to another kingdom, the kingdom of God, which he knew would eventually come. Now, he was resolved to remain faithful to, this, to God, to Yahweh, and he understood that there was no amount of material possessions or blessings that could to sustain or secure him. His only refuge and rock was God. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He wrote, he who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. If we rely on God, we have everything we need in this world. What tethered Daniel's faith to God was his hope. He and the exiles who were there in Babylon and then in Medo-Persia, the hope, their hope was in God's redemption of the tribe of Israel. The, that, that was their core for continuing in life. They, put their hope in God coming to rescue his people. Now, Daniel knew that this exile was not going to be permanent, and he had hope that the God of Israel would come and redeem his people. For Hebrews like Daniel, they used the oral tradition, and they told the stories. They told stories of Abraham and how he was, all the things that happened with him. They told the stories of Moses and his rescuing of the people. 
and of God being there with Moses as the, the key people were brought out of exile there in Egypt. God was there redeeming his people, and they reminded themselves of these stories of God being with his people even in the worst of times. Now, the God of Israel was a God that could be trusted and where they could place their hope, and they knew that this would not last forever. They continued to hope, even though it took a lot of years before this, uh, this Messiah that was to come and rescue them came. And for some, for some of them, it may have felt like it sometimes feels to us as we wait for the second coming of Christ. But we here in America, we are in a similar position to those exiles in Babylon, in that we too are living in a time of uncertainty, economically and politically, socially, morally. There are so many things going on in our country, and America is awash in uncertainty. We face uncertainty on a daily basis and uncertainty at times that simply overflows into our lives. And in that uncertainty and the suffering and pain and distress that go along with it, where do, can we find our hope and our trust? It is in our Redeemer, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's sometimes so easy to want to run to all these other things for refuge, for safety, for security, and for comfort, when we should be relying on our hope in God. Our hope comes from remembering when Jesus and, and what Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer, has done for us, as well as the fact that we are never alone. God, Jesus Christ, is with us everywhere we go. Jesus will never leave us alone, and Jesus has promised that we will never go through suffering without him being there with us, that he will supply our, our strength and the needs that we have uh, according to his riches and glory, and he has promised that he will give us strength to withstand the attack of the enemy. He promises us eternal life if we simply trust in and follow him. As the song says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. We will never stand alone as long as we believe in and hope in and trust in our rock, our redeemer, Jesus Christ. Jesus is right here standing right beside each and every one of us. And there are many times that he is actually even carrying us when we cannot stand on our own. He is our solid rock. He is our redeemer. And so when it comes to living in uncertain times, what's the best way for us to live? It's simple. We need to trust in Christ as our Savior. We need to follow him as his servants. And we need to obey him as our sovereign leader and king. You see, even though we cannot control our world, and we certainly cannot, the only thing we can control is ourselves. And so what we, can, what we can control is how we respond to the world outside. We must remain faithful in God, and we must dare to be like Daniel. Let us take heart, for Christ has secured our victory. Christ has won the battle, and his victory is ours. If we simply follow, trust, and hope in Christ's love for us. Amen. Your questions for today. Something to think about. Daniel's faithfulness was so well known by his enemies that he, they knew he was never going to compromise it. They knew that he was so faithful to God that he would never compromise his faith. So what is it that we as followers of Christ should be learning from Daniel about our faith? What is it that we need to be learning about our faith and, and how to be like Daniel in that respect? And in what ways are we currently feeling pressured by the world to compromise that faith? What is it in the world that's asking us to compromise our faith in God? So some things for you to think about, all right? Well, today we are going to practice our Holy Communion but it's going to be a little different, a lot different, than what you're used to. Today, when you came in, you should have picked up a little container that looks like this. If you don't have one, they're back there, and I ask that you go get one real quick. Um, a little instruction. 
you'll find as you look at it, there's a little tab that sticks out. And on there, there is a clear little piece of plastic up top, okay? And so when you pull that little clear plastic piece up top, top, when I ask you to, you'll find your wafer underneath that. And that'll be the first thing we do. And then when we get ready for the juice, you'll pull that other tab and it'll open up your juice and you'll be able to, to drink the juice. So if you would join me, we'll partake in our communion here. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. You are the one and only holy God, and Jesus Christ is the brightness of our, your glory. Looking all around at all the places where we as human beings wander, Jesus came to bring us home to you, O oh God. Hearing our cries of loneliness, he came to be with each and every one of us so that we might all belong to him. Seeing sin rejoicing in our suffering, he went to the cross on our behalf and died and then be, was raised to life again, baffling death with your gracious love. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took a loaf of bread and Jesus raised it to heaven and he gave you glory God by praying to you and asking you to bless that bread and to thank you for all that you had given him and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said take eat this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me and then when the supper was over he took the cup and he lifted the cup to heaven and he thanked God and he gave it to each of his disciples, and he said to them, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant given for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Now in fulfillment of Christ's promise, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us here, and get the graces which gift grace, the gifts which grace your table, O God. So now if you would take your a uh, little cup, and you would open the little part with your wafer and take your wafer. We eat the bread of life for, uh, for so that we might be strengthened to remember and to spend ourselves so, uh, so that others might be made rich in God's grace. And so we remember Christ and his sacrifice. You may partake. Now as you open, you may open your cup. Be very careful. We drink deeply from the cup, knowing you thirst for self-surrender. So we might offer ourselves as a fountain of faith to be poured out for the world, especially for the forsaken who are all around us. We pray and we remember your gift to us in your blood. At the great wedding feast of the Lamb, we will gather around your abundant table, O God. Our sisters who suffered for you on one side and our brothers who humbled themselves to lift others to their feet. All of us together at one table, your table, and we will join our hands and our hearts and our voices in singing your glad praises. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our prayer song for today as we prepare ourselves for prayer is 399, Take My Life and Let It Be. And we'll be singing verse 1 only as we prepare our hearts for prayer.
As we come to you, O oh God, we ask that you come and hear, be with us here. For we know you are a listening God, O oh God, and that you hear our prayers as you heard the prayers of our ancestors. So here now, O oh God, we ask that you hear our prayers as we offer them to you and as we offer all those things that we need to and have left unspoken to you in silence. Lord our God, as we have sat here in quietness, our thoughts are far from quiet. We are wrestling with doubts and with fears, and we're looking for answers. We're hoping against hope. We're seeking strength, and we're hungry for warm sunshine, for healed bodies, and for rest. Your word says the hungry will be filled, and we ask today that you fill us, O oh God. Fill us with the breath of life. Fill us with thankful hearts. Fill us with calmness and courage. And most of all, dear God, with the knowledge of your presence among us. We thank you, Almighty Father, everlasting God, for having been pleased through no merit of our own, but of your great mercy alone to feed us sinners, your unworthy servants, with the precious body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. There are others we know and love who are ill, and so we ask, O oh God, that you would surround them with your strong healing presence. As we pray especially for Annie, Lord, you know her situation and you know the suffering she is experiencing, and we ask that you would be with her and all those who are caring for her. And for Anita, Lord, we pray that you would be with her and walk with her through all of the treatments and whatever other things may happen, the doctors at Mayo, that you would bring them wisdom and that they would be able to bring her healing. Lord, we pray for this country and we pray for all the world that you would help all those who are suffering and who are dealing with unrest and uncertainty, fear, and anxiety, all the things that are going on in this world. We pray for safety for those who are out harvesting the fields, that they might bring in the, the, the wheat and that they may, may have a successful time at doing that without any harm coming to them. We pray for all those places who have been celebrating uh, over the, the, this weekend, Lord. We pray that everyone has been stayed safe with all of the fireworks and all of the celebrations going on. And we pray for those who may have been injured or who um, had things happen during this weekend, that you would bring healing to them. And we thank you most of all, Lord, for family, for those who love us and care for us and for all the times that we can spend together. Lord, we thank you that we are a part of your family and that you care for us and love us and that you are with us each and every day. Lord, there are so many other prayers in our world and we know that you know the concerns of this world, of all the people on this earth. In this time of fear and anxiety, Holy Spirit, commune with us 
equip us and strengthen us and convict us and encourage us toward becoming a more holy and complete church. Let us have faith like Daniel. We confess that we have pushed God aside, swelching your power within us because we sometimes are afraid of what the Spirit driving, driving our lives will mean for us and where we might be taken. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that your power would be made known in your church and in us, and in us, your people. We pray that you would build the beloved community of God here in our midst and continue to bring us to, to strength and to do your will throughout the world. In these times of, of up, unrest and, and uh, fighting about injustices, we pray that we might experience the grace and the humbleness of God the Son. Help us to humble ourselves for the sake of our siblings. Lord, teach us not to strive for anything, but in all things to humble ourselves as you did through the incarnation and in your crucifixion. Give us your grace that we might always extend grace to others. Lord, we pray that you would grant us wisdom and that you would grant wisdom to others who need answers to difficult questions that are being asked in our world. Grant hope to those who despair. Give friendship to those who are feeling lonely. And most of all, Lord God, may we know your love. The great love which you have for each one of us and every one of us. You were there at our beginnings and you will be there through the, to the end with each and every one of us. And may we never lose sight of that covenant and constant care. We look to you, O oh God, to be present in our communities, in our lives, and in our world. So make this your house into a house of prayer for all the people of this earth. That men and women in every place may love your name and joyfully offer their lives in obedient service. Continue to show us how we can be part of your work in the world and teach us how we can grow into faith and become more and more like Jesus Christ. Hear our cries, O oh God. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy, O oh Lord. So Lord, forgive us of all the wrongs that we have committed and hear our prayers. Act upon them as you know and as you see fit. Gather up all our prayers, all the unspoken and the spoken ones, Lord. For we know that all things are in your hands as we entrust ourselves and our prayers to you. As we pray in the name of the one who taught his friends to pray as one family by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is, My Hope is Built, on page 368. Your bulletins are wrong, though. I forgot to change the verses. We sang one and four last Sunday. This Sunday, we're singing two and three. So my hope is built on page 368, and we're singing verses two and three. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that there is a container in the back that you can take your little cups and drop in as you leave. Sorry.
filled with good, give to those in need. For yours is the kingdom of God. The God of your, our Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, give you spirit, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation to live in hope today and always. So go forth with God, and may God give you peace. Amen.